just to give you guys a little, uh, fill you in a little bit, as Jason mentioned, we uh, launched our two new morning services this morning, 9.30 and 11.30. And uh, the team were amazing, the people were amazing. It went off pretty smoothly, uh, as much as a, a simple vicar could hope for. And, and people came, and it was hugely exciting because you could see... Uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd multiplied. There's a bit more space for people to invite their friends, their colleagues, their neighbors. Uh, and actually, what we're beginning to see are three main congregations forming uh, on a Sunday, which is hugely exciting. Um, so thank you so much for your prayers as you have kind of got behind the, 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 the guys who are kind of spearheading uh, those morning services. And... Um, and just to mark that, I suppose, we're also starting this new series of talks uh, today as well. And um, I just wanted to say that um, this series came out of a number of conversations I had with many of you. So uh, when I first arrived, we had kind of more tea vicar, which was afternoon tea at the vicarage, and a number of people spoke to me about uh, understanding the Bible. I had a number of kind of one-to-one -one conversations with people. <laughs> and we meet every term as a uh, preaching team, a team of preachers, and uh, we talk about where do we think the church is, what are we wrestling with together, what do we think God might want to be saying to us from Scripture. And, uh, and again, this was a, a topic that came up as people felt like, actually, we, we weren't sure quite how to understand the Bible as, as we would like to. And uh, we're going through a similar process at the moment for the for talks in 2016. So if you've got any thoughts or ideas where you think, actually, I'm interested in this, but I think the church more widely uh, would be too, please do come and, and grab me. So uh, what kind of came to us as preachers was this desire to learn more about the Bible. And really, the motivation for that is, is not unreasonable, is it? It's that actually... Uh, the Bible is not the easiest book in the world to understand. So what holds it together, if anything? Does something give it its shape? Is there a road map that we can understand uh, that can take us from the beginning to the end of Scripture? And what I want to suggest to you this evening is that covenant and kingdom are precisely that. They are uh, the DNA, if you like, of the Bible. They are its architecture. So on the one hand, you have covenant, and we're going to be looking at what that means for us in terms of our identity, our being, if you like, who we are. And on the other hand, we'll look at kingdom, which is really what we're here for. What's our purpose? For covenant, it's what God has done for us. For kingdom, it's how we are to respond to what he has done for us. And so the first half of this eight-week series, we're going to have four weeks where we look at covenant and think about our sense of identity, about who we are. And we will discover that who we are only in relationship with someone else. That's the truth that we will uncover in these four weeks. Uh, so today I'm just going to be un yeah, sorry, introducing uh, covenant, nothing more than that. Uh, next week, Jason is going to be looking at the covenant of creation, or sometimes known as the covenant of works, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of intro into that later on. Um, uh, the week after, I'll be looking at the covenant of grace or promise, and then finally we'll sum it all up as we look together at the new covenant as the fulfillment of both of those. And then in the second half of the series, we'll turn our attention to kingdom, uh, and we'll think about our purpose, why we're here, and uh, what's our response to what God has done in our lives, what's our particular calling as individuals, but also our calling together as St. Peter's. And again, that'll have four parts. Of course, you can't have a kingdom without a king, so we'll look at King Jesus and what that means for us as followers of this king. And then we'll look at the community of the kingdom the family of God, and we'll think about Israel as the kingdom, and then the church as the kingdom of God. Often in uh, modern theology and, and church practice, those two things are separated, and uh, we'll look at how we might bring them back together again in a little bit. And then finally, we will conclude with the consummation, the completion of the kingdom as God brings about new creation at the end of time. What are we aiming for with this series? Just to give you a real kind of heads up, I hope really that you end this series knowing really deep down in your gut who you are in Christ. And that gives you deep security and confidence and assurance that you are loved by your heavenly Father. 
And then, secondly, that you know why you're here. You know uh, what your mission is. You're, you have a renewed sense of, of purpose, both as an individual and as a part of St. Peter's. And then, thirdly, uh, you have some sense that you could possibly understand the Bible for yourself. That's where we are going. That's what we're aiming for. But today, quite simply, we are introducing covenant. And uh, Michael Horton, in his book called Introducing Covenant Theology, says this about covenant. What unites the scriptures is not itself a central dogma or doctrine, a belief, but an architectonic structure, a matrix of beams and pillars that hold together the structure of biblical faith and practice. And that particular architectural structure that we believe the scriptures themselves to yield is the covenant. So what we're trying to avoid is imposing a system of theology on the Bible itself. We want to instead allow the Bible to say, this is the best way to understand this book, these holy scriptures as a whole. And as we look at covenant, I want to ask you a question. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Do you feel loved? Do you feel that someone has your back? Who is the person who has your back? Who is it that's on your side? I ask that because trusting others is not easy, is it? For some of us, uh, we've been let down by those we've trusted in the past. We've been hurt. Sometimes it's been betrayal, and that leaves a deep wound, doesn't it? A deep scar that makes it difficult uh, to trust again. And the amazing thing is that the message of the Bible is that the one person we really can trust is God himself. He doesn't let us down. We betray him. We disappoint him. We walk away from him, but he remains committed to us. He pursues us. He comes after us. He won't let us go. Why is that? It's because he has entered into a covenant relationship with you and with me. That is God's way of relating to us, by covenant. But what on earth is a covenant? It's all right, you're saying, yes, I get what you're saying. That's nice, kind of archaic, antique language. What actually is a covenant? Well, a covenant, quite simply, is a, a legally binding agreement, a, a kind of contract. It's a pledge, a pact, if you like. Again, Michael Horton says, a covenant is a relationship of oaths and bonds and involves mutual, though not necessarily equal, commitments. But I think we'll find that that is just the foundational definition. There's much more kind of built on top of that. And I want to look at three images tonight. The wedding, the treaty, and the will. And with all of that in mind, I want us to read Galatians chapter 4, which talks about covenant. So Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 31. You can look, use the phone to, to look at the Bible. That's perfect timing. Um, Galatians 4, 21 to 31. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman who never bore a child. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. 
But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we're going to bounce off that passage as we explore together this notion of covenant. And the first image that I want us to think about is the wedding. The wedding. As I've said, a covenant is a business arrangement, but it's not simply about rights and responsibilities. It's about more than that. It's about trust and commitment and loyalty. It's about relationship. Ultimately, it's about love. You see, a covenant is a love affair. Marriage is perhaps the best, most familiar example of a covenant. You think about a wedding ceremony, just out of interest, who has not been to a wedding ever? That's good. So you're all familiar with a a wedding? Who enjoys weddings? I like weddings. I think they're good, aren't they? Who's got married recently? Excellent. Who's getting married soon? No, that's cheeky. Sorry. Um, In a wedding ceremony, there are declarations, there are vows, uh, there is uh, a register to be signed with uh, legal witnesses that if it's done wrong, it's, it's not legal. Uh, it's, it's a formal ceremony. Um, but uh, for those of you who were married, did you, did you find, guys, did you find your, your wedding really boring? Because it was legal? No? You didn't find it boring either? Did anybody find their own wedding boring? No, I didn't find mine boring either. I actually remember uh, uh, fr- friends of ours who got married, and I wasn't doing the wedding, so I was sat in the, um, in the congregation, and uh, the bride came in, and they stood and looked at each other, and it was obviously you know, an amazing moment, and, um, and he had to say his vows. And um, the vicar re- said the first line, and he stood there like this. And it was like suddenly you begin to, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And he stayed like that with a huge smile on his face with a tear in his eyes for five minutes. Five minutes. And he, he, he was paralyzed with emotion. He knew that as soon as he spoke, his voice would break and he'd burst into tears. And so he was just doing everything in his power to gather himself. And after five minutes, he managed to squeak out these vows, and everybody cheered. He brought the house down. It was amazing. It was a moment of profound emotional intensity because two people who loved each other were covenanting together. And you know, the Bible describes the relationship between God and his people in that way, as a marriage. The church, says the, uh, Paul in the New Testament, is the bride of Christ, So in effect, when God enters into a covenant with us, he marries us. But you know, it's not just the New Testament that speaks in that way. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 16. There's an amazing description in this writing of of God's relationship, of his covenant relationship with his people. It's so tender, it's beautiful. Uh, And it begins at verse four of chapter 16 of the prophet Ezekiel, and this is what it says. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your own blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. And I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. Later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, 
and you became mine. And I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with the embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. Put a ring in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. He's preparing his bride for a wedding, isn't he? Andy Croft, who uh, helps lead uh, Soul Survivor Watford, in his book, Storyline, says this. So the unbelievable picture we have here is of a God who found Israel filthy, wretched, and abandoned, rescued her, clothed her, and protected her. Then, when she was old enough for love, he covered her nakedness and, in effect, became her husband. Isn't that an extraordinary picture? You see, covenant means commitment because you know marriage is not easy. Joanna and I have been married for 17 years, and I'm sure she will tell you that uh, I'm not the easiest person to be married to. We've had our arguments, we've had our fights, we have times when we feel distant and apart from one another. We, sometimes we just feel like we're just trying to keep up with our kids. But our commitment to each other remains resolute. And you know, God's commitment to his people is absolute. Think of another prophet, the prophet Hosea. Read it when you go home this week. God asks Hosea to love and marry Goma. And Goma is a prostitute. And she has multiple affairs. And uh, betrays Hosea again and again. She humiliates him in front of his community. He has every right to divorce her, but he does not do that. He loves her. Not because of duty, not because of this begrudging obedience to the God who's asked him to do this, but because actually he has this radical affection and devotion to Goma. And God says to him, your love for Goma is a picture of my love for my people. It's a love that is personal, dedicated, a love that is determined and ultimately faithful. Covenant is commitment. So it's an extraordinary thing to say this idea of covenant is the key that unlocks the whole Bible. It's the central theme, the roadmap, the GPS. But if any of you know your Bibles, you'll say to me, Rod, okay, I love this idea of covenant, but hang on a second, it's more complicated than that, isn't it? Because I know that there are lots of different covenants in the Bible. Isn't there Adam and Noah? What about Abraham? What about Moses and the covenant with David? What about the new covenant and Jesus? How are we to understand all of them? Well, you're right. There are all of those different covenants. But what I want to suggest to you tonight, and if you get anything, this next bit is, is a key bit, so uh, stay with me. All of those covenants effectively fit into one of two types of covenant. There is the treaty on the one hand, which is an agreement where both sides have a part to play. And there is the will, which is an agreement where one side makes a promise to the other. Now, it might be familiar to you that there are this idea of two covenants, just like we saw in the passage in Galatians, but often we misunderstand that idea. So we often say, ah, oh, the two covenants, New Testament, New Covenant, Old Testament, Old Covenant. And we say, okay, New Testament grace, Old Testament law. New uh, Covenant uh, faith, Old Covenant works. New Covenant spirit, Old Covenant letter, New Covenant Jesus, Old Covenant Moses. And when we read a passage like we read earlier on from Galatians chapter 4, and you read it kind of the first time, you read it quite quickly, you skim over it, it sounds a little bit like that because he's talking about promise on the one hand and flesh on the other, uh, freedom and slavery. But I just want to suggest to you tonight that actually that would be a mistake if you read it that way. And I've got two reasons why I think that's the case. The first is, if you read it that way, you cut your Bible in half, don't you? And you say, actually, the Old Testament is out of date. It's irrelevant. More than that, actually, the Old Testament is unchristian because it's a different 
kind of God, a different kind of relationship that we see there. And the second reason is that it, that then undermines trust, doesn't it? Because it leaves a number of questions, I think, unanswered. God said he was committed to his people. But that was the old covenant. Now there's a new covenant. What if he does the same thing to us? And there's another new covenant. Are we going to be part of that? Can we trust God? Did he change his mind? Did the people of Israel misunderstand what he was saying about the covenant? So we shouldn't understand it as New Covenant, New Testament, Old Covenant, Old Testament. The Bible's a little bit more sophisticated, more nuanced than that. Actually, what we see are these two covenants running parallel with each other from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And so we see in Galatians, actually, what Paul is talking about is Hagar and Sarah. They're both from Genesis. He talks about Moses and Abraham. Abraham is from Genesis 2, and Moses is from Exodus, the first two books of the Bible. And we're going to unpack this idea over the next two weeks. We're going to look at these two different kinds of covenant that run from the beginning to the end of Scripture as a whole, but I just wanted to introduce them today. The first is the treaty, the second is the will. So let's look at the treaty. A covenant is a kind of treaty, a pact between a king and his subjects. It's a peace treaty, if you like. So when David Cameron is uh, renegotiating our relationship with the EU, uh, eventually he will have to sign a treaty with the other nations that make up the EU. And you know, nations have been doing that with each other for thousands of years. So around the time of uh, ancient Israel, there was an empire called the Hittite Empire, And we have a number of uh, records from that empire uh, of treaties where the emperor has entered into a treaty with a conquered vassal state. And the king, having conquered this nation, promises to protect them and to defend them from other attacks. Uh, but the subjects promise in return to pay their taxes and to join the emperor's army. And there are consequences and conditions attached to that agreement. There are rights uh, for the subjects, but there are also responsibilities. There are privileges that they have. They're now protected by this uh, emperor. But there are also penalties if they fail to meet their obligations, if they choose not to pay their taxes, or if they choose not to join the king's army. And so uh, if, they, if they refuse their obligations or they don't meet them, then sanctions will be forthcoming. I was uh, in a great uh, conversation on Friday night at Rob and Rachel's house. They had a, a number of their friends over, and we were just talking about matters of faith and life. And uh, at one point, they started speaking in code. They're all teachers from Noah Hill, and they, they started talking about uh, C1 and C2. And I was like, what are you talking about? And, uh, and realized that they were talking about uh, different sanctions uh, that they were allowed to use as teachers for bad behavior from the pupils they were teaching. And, uh, and I said, you know, that's going to be in my talk on Sunday, so there it is. Um, there are sanctions in these treaties. And actually, we can see that in a number of the covenants in the Old Testament. So think for a moment about the covenant in Eden, the Garden of Eden. God makes human beings in his image as his vice regents, and he gives humanity the whole of creation to rule over, and he says, you're free to eat from any tree in the, gar uh, in the garden, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the condition. Don't do that, uh, or here's the sanction, you will die. Now, the condition is breached, isn't it? The treaty is broken, uh, and the sanction is enforced, and the human beings are driven from the garden. That's the covenant as treaty in Eden. Think about the covenant as treaty at Sinai. God uh, reveals himself to his people Israel, rescues them from slavery in Egypt, declares that they will be his people, he will be their God, and promises them the land on the condition that they keep 
his commandments, and he gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and there is a sanction if they don't keep their side of the covenant, then the curses which are outlined at the end of the book of Deuteronomy will come into force, uh, and, uh, and they will face judgment. And that is the story we see of the people of Israel, that they can't keep this treaty with God either, and they end up in exile, and they lose the land they had been given. And so what I want to suggest to you is that uh, the, the, the um, covenant in Eden, the covenant uh, at Sinai, they are basically different versions of the same covenant, and theologians call that covenant the covenant of works or the covenant of creation. You see, Israel, the people of God, was supposed to renew the covenant that had been broken with Adam. They were supposed to keep the covenant on behalf of the whole of creation, the whole of humanity, but they broke the covenant too. Does that make sense? So what is God going to do about that? How does he respond? Does he enforce the sanctions and walk away and say, enough is enough, that's it, you've had your chance, you've let me down, I'm done with you? Does he uh, reject creation and turn his back on them? Of course he doesn't. What does he do? He establishes a new covenant. It's different. It's one where he takes the initiative. He himself, he alone takes responsibility. He makes a promise to his people. And this type of covenant is much more like a will than a treaty. You see, a covenant is a last will and testament. When my dad died, he left a will, uh, and it stipulated what was, to be, uh, what was his was to be transferred to his children. It was very clear what we were to receive, what our, uh, our, our own children was to receive. We didn't have to do anything. And the writers of the New Testament want us to understand this particular aspect of covenant. So uh, the language of New Testament is the Greek word diatheke, which really means will rather than treaty. And so we're talking here about a royal grant, if you like, a promise, a gift. It's a one-sided offer. It's unconditional, without obligation. It's free. And so unlike the treaty, the king makes all the commitments himself, not the subjects. I've got another example from you from the ancient Near East, uh, from a uh, little uh, empire called the Ugaritic Empire. Uh, it was uh, just predated Israel, and this is what it says. From this day forward, Nikmadu, son of Amis Ramru, king of Ugarit, has taken the house of Pabea, which is in Ulami, and given it to Nur Nuriyana and to his descendant forever. Let no one take it from the hand of Nuriyana or his descendants forever. Seal of the king. Boom, done deal. Nuriyana doesn't have to do anything, does he? He just inherits the land. Now you think about covenant, the other covenants in the Bible. God's covenant with his people after the flood. God promises humanity that he will never again implement the sanctions that were the flood, the judgment of the flood. And he puts down his bow, just out of interest, you know the, 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 um, the rainbow that's the picture of this covenant? I used to think that was like a bow tie or like a girl's bow on a dress. Did anybody else think that? Did everybody think, no, it's obviously a bow and arrow? I'm an idiot, aren't I? You all thought it was a bow and arrow. How did I miss that for half of my life? Anyway, it is a bow and arrow. This is God the warrior laying down his bow of judgment. But you notice that he doesn't lay it down like that. He lays it down so it's facing upwards. So if it accidentally goes off, it just takes him out. It never takes us out. It's a symbol of his commitment to us. He takes responsibility for fulfilling this covenant. It's the same with Abraham. He promises Abraham that he will rescue the world through his seed. Abraham just believes that promise. He trusts him. It's the same when uh, God uh, renews his uh, covenant with David and promises to rescue the world through David's heir. You see, all of these are different versions of the same covenant. This time, this covenant is the covenant of grace, covenant of promise, if you like. And of course, um, 
Noah, Abraham, David, they're all kind of movie trailers. They're all sneak previews of the ultimate climax of the covenant, the fulfillment of the promise itself, which is Jesus. Karl Barth, the, probably the greatest theologian for the last 500 years, in the 20th century he wrote, in Christ God has at last found the perfect covenant-keeping partner. Isn't that amazing? God has at last found the perfect covenant-keeping partner. So you see, God can keep the covenant of grace, the promise he makes, precisely because Jesus keeps the covenant of works. So to keep the promise God made to Abraham, the covenant broken by Adam needs to be restored and renewed. The obligations of that broken covenant, the treaty, still need to be met. The sanctions still need to be borne. Israel, who was supposed to be represented, representative humanity, had failed in their task. Jesus is the representative Israelite, and he succeeds because he keeps the covenant of works. He lives a righteous, covenant-keeping life for us. It's not just the cross that saves us, it's his life, his holy life. He keeps the covenant for us. He is the faithful Israelite. He is the faithful human, the new Moses, the, the second Adam. And of course, he doesn't just live our life for us, he dies our death in our place. He bears the curses of the breached covenant for us so that the blessings of that covenant can be released to you and to me. Does that not thrill your heart? God does not disappoint, does he? He doesn't let us down. He doesn't betray us. He doesn't give up on us. He finds a way. You see, Jesus does for us what we can never do for ourselves, and that's exactly what Paul is talking about in the passage we read earlier. Just like Adam and Israel, all of us have broken the treaty that creation has with God. But God has made a promise to save us, to rescue us. That is the new covenant that was made to Abraham and to David. And God keeps that promise by sending Jesus, who keeps the treaty that humanity has broken. And he makes everything right between us. And you know, that truth, that simple truth, changes everything. It means we are his people. It means we are his family, his children. He is our father, and nothing can ever change that. And all we need to do is to receive the gift he offers.